invisible God, immortal God, how great thou art, immortal, immortal God, invisible God, immortal God, how great thou art, immortal. Immortal God, invisible God, immortal God, how great thou art, immortal, immortal God, invisible God, immortal God. How great thou art. Immortal, invisible, all sufficient God, the one who reigns forever, we worship you. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you adoration for all you've done for us, particularly since the beginning of this year. Thank you for victories, particularly in battles that we didn't even know you were fighting for us. Thank you that thus far you have helped us. Please accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Today, wherever your children may gather all over the world, please pay us a visit. Let every one of us have an encounter with you. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. Well, we can wave to one or two people and just say, good morning, God bless you. And then you may please be seated. We are continuing with our series on going higher. And uh, today we are moving to part 19. Going higher, part 19. First King chapter 18, verse 1. First Kings chapter 18, verse 1. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Now you will remember that last Sunday we, we read the same passage, and I told you then that... Um, there are at least two distinct ways that we could approach this particular verse, uh, one of which was prophetic. Uh, and then we learned that God was saying, no more hiding, no more running from the enemy, and that uh, rain is coming. Then I, I promise you that this week, by the grace of God, we will be going a little deeper. We'll be looking at the same passage, but looking at it from a deeper perspective. Go show yourself to Ahab. Tells us, number one, that the higher you go, the tougher your examinations become. The closer you get to God, the more difficult are his commands. Uh, you say, what do you mean by that? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> when God said to Elijah, In First King chapter 1, 
I first Corinthians chapter 17, if you read verse 2 there, from verse 2 to 6. Go to Cherith. Go and hide yourself. Ah, it's a very simple command. Go and hide from the one who wants to kill you. I will make sure you are fed. But now he's saying, go and show yourself to the one who's going to kill you. Who wants to kill you? That's a tougher commandment. But that's the way of the Lord. When he's starting with you, the commandments are simple. Or at least not that difficult to obey. But as you go higher, it's just like an examination. When you're a student in the primary school, the questions in your exams are not as difficult as when you're in the university. The higher you go, the tougher the exams become. And I'll give you one or two examples very quickly. For example, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, Genesis 12, verse 1, God said to Abraham, get out of your country. I mean, Genesis 12, you can read it from verse 1 to 3. Get out of your nation, get out of your family, get out from among your kindred, unto a land I will show you. Oh, you said that was tough enough. Yeah, we agree. But uh, it was too easy. When you compare that to what happened in Genesis 22, from verse 1 to 2, Genesis 22, from verse 1 to 2, when God said to Abraham, your only son Isaac, that I know you love, go and sacrifice him unto me. You need to understand that at that stage, Abraham was a hundred and something years old. The possibility of him having another son at all uh, looked a bit slim. Uh, God said, ah, we are closer now. We've been, <laughs> we've been together for quite a while. Now you need a tougher exam. When you look at Exodus chapter 17, from verse 1 to 6, Exodus 17, 1 to 6, when the children of Israel were thirsty and they wanted water, and God said to Moses, I'm going to stand on the rock over there, take your rod, go and strike the rock, and it will bring water for the people to drink. Well, you may say that's quite a tough exam, too. I mean, <laughs> Moses has never heard of anybody striking a rock and water will come out. But uh, it wasn't that tough. After all, if I get to the rock and I strike it, maybe there is a, a little uh, dent there that will suddenly open the way to a spring. By the time he got to Numbers chapter 20 from verse 1 to 11, Numbers 20 from verse 1 to 11, God said, this time round, don't strike the rock. Speak to it. Speak to the rock. You will notice that this was a tougher examination. That is why Moses, instead of speaking to the rock, struck the rock. The higher you go, the tougher the exams become. But the second thing you need to know here is that examinations are always pro proportional to the ability of the student. The exam will always be proportional to the ability of the student. No one will give a university kind of question 
to somebody who is in the secondary school or primary school, exams are always proportional to the ability of the student. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, the Almighty God said in his word, you will not be tempted more than you are able to bear. And with every examination, God will make a way of escape. In other words, God will not demand from you something he knows you cannot handle. It's very important. You see, the first exam that Job faced in Job chapter 1 from verse 1 to 22 Job 1 from verse 1 to 22 was tough enough. But God knew that Job will pass. And in the name that's above every other name, whatever exam may come your way, you will pass. Amen. Job 2, Job chapter 2 from verse 1 to 10, the devil's recommended a tougher exam for Job. Listen to what the devil said. He said, skin for skin. Anything a man has, he will give it for his own life. Job had lost children, lost weather. Let's give him some very severe personal pain and watch. But God knew he would pass. Because the Bible says when that second examination came, even the wife of Job added to the pressure and said, hey, man, <laughs> are you still trusting God? Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. It's better that you die than that you continue to live. And the Bible said, Job refused to sin. He passed. And once again, I pray, you will pass all your exams. Yeah. But then that brings us to the next statement that God uh, made here. He said, I will send the rain. You go and show yourself to Ahab, and I will send the rain. To every examination, there is a reward. Each time a student writes an exams, it's so that he can go higher. We write exams after, uh, at the end of our days in the primary school, so we can be promoted. We write an exam at the end of the secondary school, promotion. Each time we write an exam, it is because promotion is around the corner. In Genesis chapter 12 that we mentioned earlier on, verse 1 to 3, Genesis 12 from verse 1 to 3, God told Abraham, you obey me, I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will become a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will cause those who curse you. Through you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That's a lot of reward for a simple exam. Go out of your father's house and so on. When he had to face a greater exam in Genesis 22, from verse 1 to 18, Genesis 22, from verse 1 to 18, when he passed the exam, the Bible said, God said, I swear, by myself have I sworn, in blessing I will bless you, in multiplying I will multiply thy seed, like the stars of heaven. Whenever... There is an exam. There is a reward ahead. In the case of Job, when he passed that second test, 
The Bible tells us in Job chapter 42 from verse 12 to 16, Job 42 from verse 12 to 16, that God blessed the latter ends of Job more than its beginning. God gave him double everything that the enemy took away from him and then gave him 140 years extra to enjoy them. Whenever there is a tough exam, there will be a big reward. The bigger the exams, the greater the reward. Are you going through some very tough examinations right now? Ah, get ready. Your testimonies will be big. Yeah. However, you need to know that when examinations cease, promotions cease. As long as you are doing exams, you keep on being promoted steadily. When there is no more exams, <laughs> Promotions will come to an end. Remember, we are talking about going higher. It has been said, when you no longer have tests, then you no longer have testimonies. Because what is a testimony? <laughs> testimony is that you, you, you had a test, you cried to God for help, and you survived. Testimonies simply are the results of tests passed. That's why you discover that when somebody gets up in a congregation, maybe like our own Holy Ghost service or something, and he, it says, oh, glory be to God, uh, last month I had headache, I prayed, and God healed me. People said, sit down, let us hear some good testimonies. <laughs> but when somebody says, I had cancer, stage four, the doctor said there's no hope. I cry to the almighty God, and look at me now. They've checked everywhere. There's no trace of cancer people will stand up and clap. When somebody says, ah, praise the Lord, everybody, well, they, they are, praise the Lord, they are, hallelujah, it's always a bit cool, because we want to hear first, what was it? And he says, ah, the, the doctors examined me, they said I have no, no ovary, I have no fallopian tube, I came to the Holy Ghost service, I cried to the Almighty God in his own miraculous way. He gave me brand new spare parts. Now look at my set of twins. Everybody will clap. The bigger the test, the bigger the testimonies. When there are no more tests, no more testimonies. That's why... <laughs> I find it a bit interesting when I say, well, we will not hear your testimony. And some people say, amen. I hope they know the meaning of the prayer. <laughs> because it means they are going to have another test. But in the name of Jesus Christ, we are going to pass. Amen. In Philippians chapter 3, from verse 13 to 14, Philippians 3, 13 to 14, Paul said, I just keep on forgetting what has happened in the past. And I press on, getting ready for the next examination so that I can get the next promotion. But you know what? In this statement, go show yourself unto Rahab, and I will send the rain. The biggest part of the story is the converse 
you know, in mathematics, when we, when, when, when we state it, it, a theory, if this is this and this is this, this is what will happen. When we always look at the other side, and if this is not this, then this is what is likely to happen. You know what is embedded in this statement that uh, shook me a little bit? It is that God is actually saying, you don't go to show yourself to Ahab, there will be no rain. That's frightening. Go show yourself and I will send the rain. Refuse to go, there will be no rain. You know, in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, Isaiah 1, 19 to 20, it says, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. If you refuse and rebel, then get ready for destruction. (laughs) When I looked at this story, I said, Lord, have mercy. God was saying to Elijah, the faith of a nation is in your hand. You obey me, the problem of the nation will be over. You disobey me, well, the opposite will also be true. A man, a single man, can determine the fate of a nation. Listen to me very well, because you might be the one God is talking to now. In Ezekiel 22, from verse 30 to 31, Ezekiel 22, from verse 30 to 31, the Almighty God said, I look for a man, one man, who will stand in the gap before me, between me and the nation, so that I don't pour my anger on the nation. He said, but I found none. He didn't say, I'm looking for many. He said, I'm looking for just one man. (laughs) In 1 Samuel chapter 17, you can read the story again from verse 1 to 51. 1 Samuel 17, 1 to 51. When Eliah, uh, when... uh, Goliath was terrorizing a whole nation. He made the matter plain. All I need is one man from your side. If I beat him, your nation will become our slaves. If he beats me, then you take over our nation. He took only one man, one man. Maybe you are the one God has been waiting for to solve the problem of your nation. In 2 Kings chapter 7, from verse 1 to 11, 2 Kings chapter 7, from verse 1 to 11, a whole nation was under tremendous siege. It took one man, just one man, to say, I decree, within 24 hours, the tide will turn. And what he decreed came to pass. You can determine the fate of your nation. You can determine the fate of your city. You alone. You can stand in the gap for your nation. You can stand in the gap for your city. But let's bring it closer home. 
the fate of your family is in your hand. Genesis chapter 6, from verse 1 to 22. Genesis chapter 6, from verse 1 to 22, tells us that when God wanted to wipe out the whole world, one man, called Noah, found grace with God. His family was saved because of woman who was willing to obey God, who was willing to be to build an ark. Because God said so. <clears throat> At a time when they had never been rain. God said it's going to rain. I want you to prepare an ark. Do this. Do that. And he obeyed. And he rescued his family from destruction when every other family perished. Do you know that your action or in action can determine what will happen to your family? I'll give you one more example and then we will pray. In 2 Kings chapter 5, from verse 20 to 27. 2 Kings chapter 5, from verse 20 to 27. One man, by the name of Gehazi, decided to collect wealth by fraudulent means. And I hope somebody is listening to me. Decided to collect wealth by fraudulent means. He wanted to prosper at all costs. And when the punishment was given, when the judgment of God was announced, the man of God said, the leprosy of Naaman will cleave unto you and to thy seed forever. Action of woman. And forever. Anybody born in the generation of Gehazi must end up a leper. You know, in the olden days, when you go to a family, at least in my own tribe, and you say you want to marry their daughter, they will say, good, go and come back. As soon as you leave, they go and find out the history of your family. Has there been a leper in the family before? Has there been a madman in the family before? Has there been one terrible disease or the other in the family before? Because they know sooner or later, whatever had been in the family before, we show up again. We talk of generational causes. Almost invariably, it starts with one man. And of course, we talk of generational blessings. It will also start with a man. What do you want for your own family? Blessings that will last forever? God said, I swear to Abraham, in blessing I will bless you, in multiply I will multiply thy seed. And through thy seed, the whole world will be blessed. Today, everyone who is a child of Abraham, we have the seed of Abraham. For a child of God, we have the seed of Abraham. And we claim that blessing. 
If you are of the seed of Gehazi, you know what you can claim. But the good news is, if you give your life to Jesus Christ, you cross over from one family to another, the family of God. Because he said, to as many as believed in him, to them gave he power to become sons of God. So you can give your life to Jesus Christ today, and all of a sudden, the blessings of Abraham can become yours. You can refuse, and whatever you have to face, it's up to you. But those of us who claim to be Christians now, watch out, be careful. The fate of your family is in your hand. And one of us can rise up and stand in the gap for our city and for our nation. And God will honor that commitment. Shall we pray? I'm calling on those of you who have not yet surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. The word of God made it clear. If a man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You can come away from under the curse that is in your family by crossing over to the side of Jesus Christ so that everything can begin afresh for you. Please don't delay because the curse is like a river flowing downhill from whoever did something wrong. Only God knows how many years before you were born. But you can have a brand new beginning now if you give your life to Jesus Christ. So I'm appealing to you, if you have not yet given your life to Jesus Christ, do so now. If you are in a church setting, please run to the altar and go and fall on your face before the Almighty God and say, save my soul. Move, him, move me over to the fam family of God. And let me now begin to enjoy the generation, generational blessings of Abraham. Because the Bible says, if you have Christ, then you have the seed of Abraham. Quickly now, cry unto Jesus for salvation. And please, the rest of us, let's intercede for those who are giving their life to Jesus now. And pray that the Almighty God will save their souls. And please, Cry to God for yourself that you will never leave the family of God so that you don't go back to that family curse that is running down in your own particular family. And then I'm going to encourage those of us who are Christians who have heard this word today. If the Spirit of God had ministered to you that you are the one God is waiting on to stand up, not just for your family, but for your city or for your nation, that from now on, you take the body on and begin to cry to the Almighty God to spare your city, to spare your nation. Because you are going to make sure you will do everything within your power to please the Almighty God. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for taking us deeper in your word. We thank you especially for those who say we want to cross over into the family of God today. Father, please receive them. Save their souls. Let your blood wash away their sins. Give them a brand new beginning, O oh Lord. Write their names in the book of life. 
When they call on you, please answer them. And I am praying for every child of God today, whatever may be the curses in their families, Lord God Almighty, change to blessings today. And those of us that have heard your word, and your word that pierces our hearts, the grace, Lord God Almighty, to stand up for our families, stand up for our cities, stand up for our nation, give unto us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Almighty God. For in Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, I want to rejoice with those of you who have given your life to Jesus. I want to assure you that from now on, I'll be praying for you. If you just let me know your names, your address, and your prayer request, I promise you I'll be interceding for you. And I will encourage you to go to the nearest Redeemed Christian Church of God to you. Tell the pastor there that I sent you, and he will tell you what to do next. God bless you all. Amen.